it's uh, nice to see uh, numbers uh, in polls. The only one that counts is tomorrow. And I want all British Columbians, particularly those that uh, are supporting the NDP, to remember that if you don't vote, it doesn't count. Advanced polls are open. We've got 33 hours to go before the election's over, and we're very confident that we can make a difference in British Columbia. What we've shown for three and a half years is that when there is that balance of responsibility in the legislature, there is that ability uh, for us to better serve the people of British Columbia. BC's provincial party leaders are making their final pitch to voters. It's election day there tomorrow. NDP leader John Horgan called the election early in a bid to nab a majority, and polling suggests the bet could pay off for Horgan. So what have been the key moments of the campaign? We've convened our BC panel. One final time, Shachi Curl is the president of the Angus Reid Institute. Hey there, Shachi. James Moore is a former federal conservative cabinet minister, now a senior business advisor with Denton's Canada. They're both in Vancouver. Hi there, James. And Brian Topp is a former BC NDP campaign manager, now a partner with KTG Public Affairs. We reached him in Toronto today. So welcome back, everybody. Uh, James, I want to start with you. Do you think that there was a defining moment or a defining issue in this campaign? Uh, I, th I think the ballot question that the NDP have been driving for is one that I don't think has been budged from the voters' minds, which is don't change horses in midstream. Mm. Uh, you know, Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick, I think Scott Moe in Saskatchewan and John Horgan uh, have all witnessed the same thing, which is while the public may be annoyed at the fact that there's a campaign in the middle of a pandemic, it may be opportunistic, it may be crass, it may be unwise in terms of a, a health context. Public, The public, I think, sort of has baked into their psyche that politicians will be self-serving and do these kinds of things. But that said, given the question that's before them, is it wise to change governments in the middle of a pandemic while we're dealing with a health crisis and the economic crisis today and tomorrow? Um, and I think voters are sort of siding with incumbent governments and saying, in spite of the fact that I'm annoyed that there's a campaign, I don't think it's a good time to change governments, change cabinets and all of the disruption that happens over the month or month to three months after a campaign to have an adjustment to a new government. And I think John Horgan has benefited from that. And I think it's been very challenging for Andrew Wilkinson, the BC Liberal leader, to change that narrative. Brian Top, I'd be interested to hear whether you agree with that narrative and whether you would, would point to any issues that you think carry serious weight in this campaign. Well, the first thing I'd like to say with all due respect to uh, my fellow panelists is I have taken a pledge to never believe in a BC poll. <laughs> so we, will see, uh, we will see what happens, but uh, I, I do think that Essentially, the uh, defining issue of the campaign was that there were no defining issues of the campaign. Uh, it ends where it began, which is who do you trust to manage the COVID crisis and what comes after it? And, uh, you know, my son is working on a, on a, uh, on a uh, calling voters. And uh, what he reports is about half of the respondents, maybe give, give or take a few points, are saying that they support the government and think it's doing a good job. And something like that may be what happens in the election. We're soon going to see... Uh, Shachi, I could I could see you on my little extra monitor here in the uh, in, in the studio, and I saw you blinking <laughs> rather intensely when Brian made that comment about polls. Uh, so, I, 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 would you agree with the analysis? And is there anything you would like to say about your craft as well at this point? Uh, you know, I'm gonna I'll, I'll take the first. Uh, I'll speak like a politician, which Brian and James are, are very <laughs> adept in and practiced in, and take the second part of that question first, Catherine, and say. Yep. You know, we're, we're pretty much done with having to defend our craft. Uh, yes, BC in 2013 was an anomaly. BC in 2017, by the way, was called uh, by most pollsters bang on. So, uh, and there have been many, many, many elections since 2013. So, kind of done with that, over it. Now, moving on to the other. We should probably say that politically, as a political mm -hmm. operative, it is probably a great idea to always push all the way to the end and not let polls decide. I don't know. I don't know if that's controversial, but... Uh... Polls actually change the dynamic of a mm -hmm. campaign, mm -hmm. right? Yep. Sometimes if you see the numbers really, really high for a party, what that hap what happens is there's almost a suppressing or a depressing mm -hmm. uh, effect on campaign supporters who go, well, they've got this locked up. We don't need to bother. We don't need to go line up. Uh, conversely, for the opposition, if, if they go and tell their, uh, their supporters, well, actually, we're closer than we are, it can sometimes bring them out in greater numbers. But let's, let's, let's return yep. to the campaign as it was. I concur. Uh, <laughs> I think, 
James and James and uh, and Brian, to an extent, I think, have it in terms of uh, the ballot question being pandemic response and really sort of riding that the coattails of or the halo effect of Dr. Bonnie Henry and the and the uh, experience in British Columbia, while it has not been perfect, has been far better, for example, than Alberta, Ontario, Quebec, in terms of deaths, hospitalizations and case count. That said, I think, you know, it's always really important to remember that these things are never binary. It's not NDP or not NDP. It's NDP versus the opposition or the incumbent versus the opposition. And so voters are not only making up their mind about the record of the government that's asking to be reelected, they're also looking pretty critically at the opposition. And this is a campaign that's been defined by the opposition, both the Greens and the BC Liberals, just not being able to get any traction. And a lot of that has to do with the performance of BC Liberal leader Andrew Wilkinson. I said, I think the first time we talked about this some weeks ago, that Wilkinson had to have a dream campaign. It had to be best campaign ever for him. And it, it wasn't. It wasn't yeah. uh, James, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective. I mean, you you talked uh, about the impact that COVID had sort of on, I guess, the, the narrative and, and the perspective of voters. But I'm also curious about a lessons learned perspective because we're watching these provincial governments um, and these provincial parties learn how to co campaign in the midst of COVID. And I just wonder if there's anything sort of interesting you've heard from the people that you're talking to about how, you know, what the takeaways ought to be. Yeah, I mean, I have friends, frankly, who are running for the BC Liberal Party and the BC New Democrats, who I've known for years, some former members of parliament uh, who, are, who are running, and I've had conversations with them. And across the board, they find it extraordinarily challenging. Uh, you know, you, you go door knocking um, and canvassing in a community, and often people won't answer the door for obvious reasons of, mm -hmm. of a sense of the responsibility to be isolated. And other people answer the door and they say, what the hell are you doing? And then there are those who answer the door and say, I'm glad actually a politician is coming around, but you don't know what you're going to get. And if you have any risk that you're going to offend a voter, you probably don't do it. So you have a bunch of candidates who are embracing social media, whether it's TikTok or Twitch or a YouTube channel or having a podcast or tweeting and Facebook. But it's not clear which any of those mediums are connecting with voters. So it's mm. it's it's kind of a dog's breakfast in terms of the modality of how to get your message out in the modern area. And of course, there's a general collapse of traditional media. Newspapers are not being purchased, as we know. Broadcast journalism is being challenged on a, on a whole bunch of fronts. And so I think local candidates and even Andrew Wilkinson in particular are finding it very difficult to get their message out to the public. And then you add to that the fact that the the uh, uh, the uh, um, chief electoral officer for elections BC in the province said today that about one third of the votes that are going to be cast in the election uh, are going to be mailed in and they won't be tabulated for up to two weeks after election day. So tomorrow night is election day, but up to a third of the votes won't be fully counted until two weeks after election day. And so it's an interesting fact, but if you're a candidate campaigning and you, you think that a third of the voters have already voted, you have to factor that in. So thinking to a federal election in the spring perhaps of next year or fall of next year, a lot of these lessons are going to have to be applied about how do you get maximum velocity for the input of your campaign in terms of voter turnout and what it'll mean in terms of getting your message out and getting those ballots put into the box. Brian, what do you think about about that particular aspect of it? I mean, it's true the mail-in ballot has proven to be a big part of the BC story. What do you what are you thinking about not just the vote but the the week that will follow it? Yeah, I mean, something like one and a half million votes are in the in the mail. And so we we're not we you know we may not have a reliable result for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. But what this really tells you in terms of campaigns is that the first two or three weeks are incredibly important because people start to vote early, and this is not going to turn around. You know, we're I, I think the trend, uh, notwithstanding our friends to the south, is to make it easier to vote, and that means giving people more days to vote, and that means you better have a strong open because people will start voting in the middle of the campaign. I, I think what we will find is, you know, the, the, the debates that typically are, you know, half to two thirds of the way into the, into the campaign are the new E-Day. And then E-Day goes on for the back third of the campaign. That's fascinating. And the ramifications of this uh, incredible situation we find ourselves in continue to be felt. Listen, we're out of time for today, but thank you to, to all three of you. Appreciate it. Brian, Chachi, and James Thank Moore. You. As you heard earlier in the show, British Columbians head to the polls tomorrow, and depending on how the vote shakes out, there could be some new, younger faces in the legislature. At dissolution, the youngest MLA was 
the ripe old age of 35. My next guests want to chop that number almost in half. Kate O'Connor is the B.C. Green candidate for Saanich South. She just turned 18. Corbin Kelly is the B.C. Liberal candidate for Kootenai West. He is 19. And Laura Parent is the B.C. NDP candidate for Prince George Vailmount. She's 21. Welcome, all three of you. Delighted to have you on the program. You are all, I'm sure our viewers just gleaned, under the age of 22. Kate, I want to start with you because you are the youngest. Was there, did the thought ever cross your mind, am I too young to do this? No, not at all. I mean, legally you can do it when you're 18, but it's a crucial time in history, especially for young people to be standing up and participating. I mean, the decisions that are made now are going to affect young people's future. And so for me, it was it was a no brainer that now is a time to stand up and fight for what I believe in. Have you experienced any pushback uh, when you told people you wanted to run or when people encounter you, I guess, over the course of the campaign and, and find out your age? Yeah, I mean, for sure, I've definitely experienced being underestimated by people and people just wanting to focus on my age and not hear what I'm trying to say about issues. You know, youth have perspectives on issues that are different from other people. So that has definitely been um, challenging, to say the least. But I believe in the value of intergenerational leadership. And so I've been pushing through that and, and trying to get my message across. Uh, Corbin, I'd like to ask you uh, further to what Kate is saying. Is it is it hard sometimes to feel that you are being listened to when you're 19 years old and you're entering the political process. People have been doing this for longer than you've been alive in some cases. That's very true. No, um, I think when people actually start listening, they realize that, you know, we as young people actually have really good ideas um, and they are interested in listening to them. I, I personally have been fortunate that people are more grateful that I'm young and running and I haven't faced a lot of pushback, but I wouldn't be surprised that you know, in the future when I start moving out of the the quiet riding of Kootenai West and, and into bigger and better things as a young person facing more pushback from that. So, Laura, what about you? What, what was your experience when you decided to make the jump in? Oh, of course, there's so many different things that you have to consider when you're looking at running. Uh, generally, the response has been really positive. There's always those few that are going to say that you're too young and you don't do this and you can't do that. Uh, but generally, it's very, very positive. Is this what you uh, expected? That being said, I... Pardon? Is this what you is this what you thought you were signing up for? Like you you've done it now, right? The campaign is basically over. It, it, did it turn out as you expected? I think it did. Yeah, in some ways, it definitely surpassed my expectations. There were a lot of positive comments, and, and as I said, there's there's always those negative ones too. Um, I for a long time I kind of stopped. Uh, starting with my age and stop telling people that I was a young candidate and just start talking about issues. Uh, because when people hear that number, that's the first thing that they look at instead of actually listening. So by doing that, I could kind of engage with people a little bit better. Um, but generally, people have been really receptive to it. And I'm so glad to see that even in my small riding in northern BC, people understand that we need new voices. And those new voices are really important. Okay, now you've all brought up the question of issues. So Kate, I'm going to come back around to you. I think, I think we would be remiss. I think I would be making a bad choice if we made this whole interview about your ages. I'd like to talk to each of you um, briefly about what the principal issue is that inspired you to get involved in politics. And Kate, I'd like to start with you. What, what, what was the thing that really spurred you? So, I mean, there's so many reasons why I decided to get involved in politics. One of them is because I was so disappointed and, and shocked to see the government treatment of Indigenous peoples, and also government inaction and lack of urgency surrounding the climate crisis. So seeing a government that was increasing oil and gas subsidies and continuing to log old growth didn't didn't speak to me that the government understood that we were in a climate crisis. And I really believe that we need to inject urgency into our climate action plans. So because decisions, decisions are being made that play into this four-year planning cycle. And we need people who are in the legislature who care profoundly about the long term. And, and that's young people. So that's, that's the reason why I decided to get involved and why I got involved specifically with the Green Party. Corbin, I'd like to bring you in. You come at this from a different part of the political spectrum. What was the issue that really got you excited about jumping into politics? I think kind of playing off of what Kate's saying is that, you know, many times we see governments focused on this four-year plan, right? We don't really look any farther than you know, when we're going to be reelected. And the issue to me was that I keep seeing governments um, spending money like it grows on trees. And my biggest concern is that we are going to be accumulating so much debt that I'm going to be responsible for paying off. My kids are going to be responsible for paying off. My grandkids are going to be responsible for paying off. So 
for me, the BC Liberal Party uh, has a lot of really strong policies around fiscal responsibility, and that's something that I strongly believe in because, you know, our economy can't be strong and secure if, you know, the government is in massive debt. So, uh, Lauren, Laura, what about you? What was the issue? For me, it was education. Uh, I grew up in an era of revolving education strikes that happened about every two or three years. And that was really frustrating. I lost out on opportunities. And being a student in Northern BC, we didn't have enough teachers. I wasn't allowed to take field trips when I was in high school because we didn't have substitute teachers to fill those roles. Uh, so at that point, I, I knew that something had to be done and we needed more voices, younger voices and different perspectives in government. Uh, that kind of pushed me to, to enter politics and get involved in different ways. Uh, and since then, there have been so many issues that I have noticed or have been brought to my attention that I'm so passionate about now. One of them, for example, is seniors care. And every time I say that, everyone laughs a little bit and says, well, how can you know someone young understand seniors care? Uh, but that, the way we treat our seniors kind of speaks broadly about our government. Mm -hmm. uh, and I kind of started to see that people were being left behind the traditional narratives of government. Mm -hmm. And by bringing in other perspectives, you can bring those people back into government, back into spheres of conversation so people are taken care of. I'm gonna, yeah, I'm gonna jump in here because we only have a few minutes left, but I would like to get, I guess, a parting thought from each of you about the most important lesson that you've learned, your takeaway from this, or the thing that you want people to know about what it's like to be a young person uh, who's a candidate in the political system right now. And once again, Kate, I'll start with you. Great. Um, yeah, I mean, my campaign has been about many things, but it's it's been about challenging people's ideas about who should be in politics, who should be represented. I've definitely been underestimated, I would say, as a young woman, uh, receiving blatant and underhanded comments. And I think it's about rejecting this old style of politics. And so one thing I appreciate about the Green Party is that we have several strong female leaders to look up to, because it's important that young women, and especially young women of color, see themselves reflected in political leaders, because the only way we can really create a just society and a fair society is when we have the most people as possible involved in the mm -hmm. political process. Cor Corbin, uh, I'm going to ask you to be relatively concise here, but what's the big takeaway sure. from, for you? Don't hesitate. Um, I think, you know, my one thing when I was contemplating about running in this election is I wanted to wait a few days to think about it. And I think the best thing, the best decision that I did was just saying yes, because had I waited and thought about this for a few days, I probably wouldn't have run because I would have been able to talk myself out of it. So don't hesitate. Don't try to think twice about it or create reasons about why you shouldn't run, but get involved. And Laura, what about you? Very similar. Jump two feet in. Go do the best you can. Uh, don't pay attention to the negative stuff. I had an attack ad released about me, uh, and that can be really intimidating, but you can't listen to that. Uh, you're there for a reason. You have supporters for a reason, and you belong in politics. Young voices belong here. Well, guys, I, I just, I really have to applaud you. I definitely did not have my uh, perspectives figured out <laughs> when I was your age. And, you know, ev I think everyone who tunes into this show, we really uh, value democracy and the democratic process. And it is, it, it's fantastic that all three of you at, uh, at the beginning of your, your careers are, are doing this. So we wish you all in the most nonpartisan of fashions, uh, the best of luck with the vote results. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all Thanks. for your time. Hi, I'm Vashi Capello's host of Power in Politics. See more of our show by subscribing to the CBC News Channel or click the link for another video.